never be afraid. There's nothing which is known which can't be understood. And there's nothing which is understood which can't be explained. For over 50 episodes now, my team and I have brought you to the very frontier of knowledge in physics and astronomy. And still, our mission goes on. To present you with your birthright, an understanding of the universe. I've traveled the world seeking out a certain type of genius. Masters of not only their academic disciplines, but also at explaining their research in understandable ways. And I've bestowed upon these women and men the title of Titanium Physicist. You're listening to the Titanium Physicist Podcast, and I'm Ben Tippett. And now, L.A. Physique! There's something out there, something you can't see with your eyes, but you can tell it's there based on how everything else you see moves around it. Like garbage on the sidewalk, like a raccoon on the road. What can you know about the things you can't see? You know that there must be a lot of it, and you know that you can't see it, and you know that it must come from wherever everything else comes from. Even knowing what you can't know tells you something. Every hole in your knowledge, every mystery, is a clue. Today on the Titanium Physicist Podcast, we're talking about dark matter. Speaking of staring the unknowable truths of the universe in the face and never blinking, our guest today is a musician and the host and creator of one of my favorite podcasts, The Drabblecast, where short stories of the weird genre are read to you and celebrated. Welcome to the show today, Norm Sherman. Thank you for having me. All right, Norm, I've got two amazing titanium physicists lined up for you today. Arise, Ken Clark. Uh, Whoosh. Dr. Clark did his master's degree with me at Queen's University and finished his PhD at Queen's. He was a postdoc at Oxford and Penn State and a professor at the U of T. And now he's working as a research scientist at Snow Lab, where he's looking for dark matter. And arise, Caitlin Schutz. Kablam! Dr. Schutz got her undergraduate degree from MIT and her PhD from UC Berkeley, and she's currently at MIT, where she's a Papillardo Fellow in physics, and she studies cosmology and particle physics. All right, everybody, let's talk about how to figure out what isn't there and is there based on what you don't see. So, Norm, have you ever heard of dark matter before? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of it. Uh, I, at least I, I think I've heard of it. I mean, who knows what if any of this is real or happening right now? As we speak, I mean, it's all just theory, I guess. Ah, well, that's the thing about all of this. No direct detections to date, but we still have some very promising clues and reasons for believing about dark matter. So let's get started. The biggest clue to dark matter comes from gravity. The deal here is that gravity as a science has really exploded in the last hundred years. Um, Before then, there was Isaac Newton and Kepler's laws and planets going around the sun, which was absolutely great. Uh, but since then, we've discovered all, all sorts of things. Uh, for one of them, Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity, it's called. It's a theory that describes gravity in terms of flowing space-time. So depending on where you are, the rate that time passes and your sense of how long and short things are might be different. Uh, for instance, the deeper in a gravitational well you go, the slower time passes. And so a combination of these effects give us essentially what we recognize as the force of gravity. It's delightful. Um, So along with that came kind of a revolution in astronomy. For instance, we didn't know that we were in a galaxy a little bit over 100 years ago. That's That's a fairly modern discovery. Originally, we thought the universe kind of ended at our galaxy, but we thought everything else past it was just kind of clouds of dust or whatever. We weren't quite sure. 
Um, as telescopes improved, we were able to look at the faraway stuff and see that lots of these other cloudy bits we saw out past the edge of our galaxy were actually galaxies in their own right. And there's galaxies as far as we can see. Totally amazing. And then so as our ability to do astronomy improved, so too did our ability to compare it with theory. And kind of theory motivated uh, exploring deeper and deeper into astronomy. So there's two big kind of factors that were discovered. Uh, the first is called a galactic rotation curve. Essentially what astronomers did is they said, well, you know, more or less Isaac Newton's sense of gravity determines kind of how fast objects go around the center of the galaxy. The more material is between you and the center of the galaxy, uh, the more material is inside your orbit, the heavier your star's sense of the galaxy is, and uh, it determines how fast you go around. So what they did was they, they looked at that kind of two ways. It was, it was hopefully a way to weigh the galaxy, figure out how much mass it had. You could look at how fast stars on the edges of galaxies were going around, and you could tell how much matter there was inside. Um, so there were kind of two ways to weigh a galaxy. One was to do that and use uh, gravity as an indicator of how heavy one of these galaxies were. And the other was to count up all the stars. That makes sense, right? Yeah. So the big problem was uh, the numbers didn't agree. And they didn't agree in a really weird way. Uh, the deal is that there's about 10 times more mass in a galaxy, generically, than there are stars. And the stars are all kind of distributed kind of in a in a plane, you know, in a big plate shape as they all go around the middle. But the mass, as they looked at the mass distribution, seemed to not be distributed more. It was more like a three-dimensional sphere of matter. And we didn't know what, it, what, what this was. It, was. it was something they called dark matter because you couldn't see it. it. It had mass. It was gravitating. It was adding to the gravity of the system. But it, it wasn't luminous. It didn't absorb any of the light from the galaxy. Like it would if it was, say, dust or planets or objects made of regular matter. And it also uh, didn't emit any light. So we don't think it interacts with light at all. So mm. that in itself is mysterious and creepy. And a bunch of different kind of propositions for what it might be came about. Uh, some people thought that maybe it was matter that you couldn't see. Some people thought it was little black holes. Some people thought maybe there was a particle that we couldn't see causing the matter. Some people thought that our understanding of gravity was wrong, that maybe there was a different uh, equation that described gravity in a galaxy than gravity in a solar system. Nobody really knew. But an interesting parallel development in astronomy started happening when we started looking at um, astronomy from really, really far away objects and astronomy in different types of light other than visible light. If you look into the infrared, the universe looks totally different. And if you look at uh, ultraviolet, the universe looks totally different. You can see different types of things in the universe uh, than you can in visible light. And when we started looking at the universe in microwave radiation levels, so microwave light, we saw something really, really strange. Um, well, everywhere you looked in the sky, there was kind of light coming into the Earth. And all of that light was kind of the same color, indicating it was the same temperature. It's very strange. I mentioned Einstein's theory of general relativity at the very start because it's pertinent to this discussion. Um, Einstein's most famous stuff with general relativity are black holes. Everybody knows about You know about black holes, Norm? Mm, yeah, yeah, the blackest of holes. That's right. They're fantastic. Uh, even light can't escape them. So, Einstein's theory also predicted something really fascinating. It predicted that the universe could change over time. I mean, it was discovered mathematically, th this proposal that the universe might be expanding or shrinking or doing something weird. Einstein himself really didn't like it. Um, he famously thought that it was a mistake in his equations and added another term called a cosmological constant to his equations to keep it from happening. But it was eventually discovered when we looked at how distant galaxies were moving away from us that Einstein's theory was right in, in that sense. The universe is uh, dynamic. It is changing. It started in a big bang and it, it continued to expand after that day. So our universe is expanding and that's really, really weird because it means that our universe wasn't always just stars and gas. Once upon a time, our universe was so dense and packed full of hot energy that it, it was just all a big hot gas 
Like if you were like in the envelope of the sun or something like that, it was just hot uh, everywhere you went. So the deal is that the um, microwave radiation that we were seeing coming from all directions is afterglow from the Big Bang. Essentially, uh, the Big Bang happened. Uh, there was a time when the universe was really, 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 really hot, and everywhere there was hot light, and everywhere there, there was hot particles about the same distribution. And over time, our universe cooled. And some of the hot light that was around back then didn't ever get absorbed. It still kind of wandered the universe. And so whenever you look out into the sky, no matter which direction you're looking, some of that hot light, which is now very cold light, will hit your microwave receiver. And it, we call it the cosmic microwave background. And a cosmic microwave background is fascinating because it is direct evidence of what the universe looked like right after the Big Bang. So it's not like the Big Bang was kind of really speculative anymore. We saw evidence that the, that the universe was spreading out uh, based on looking at how distant galaxies were moving away from us. But you could also look at the cosmic microwave background as evidence to determine qualities of the universe as it grew up. And does it give indicators as to uh, possibly what caused the Big Bang or what existed prior to the Big Bang, maybe, if that is the very kernel of information that we have right there at the very beginning? Well, the information that we have involves looking at kind of rates of expansion and looking at the qualities of the cosmic microwave background. It doesn't fill us in on the whole picture, but it does give us indications about how the universe has evolved if we roll backwards in time using Einstein's equations. And the picture is that the universe either was always infinitely large, but started infinitely dense. Everywhere you could go in the universe, the distance between every point was zero. It had no volume somehow. And then it sprung out of nothing. In Einstein's theory, time is attached to distances. So before the Big Bang, time didn't exist. So that's a possibility. Our universe might have started at a singularity. Our universe might have started with uh, another universe almost, which started out contracting into a big crunch that bounced that's a possibility. We're not quite sure about it. It's hard to tell because our physics theories don't really apply on occasions where, where the density gets that dense. We know that, that Einstein's equations only reply after a certain moment in the Big Bang. Essentially, our theories don't go past a certain point to tell us how the universe started in that t is equal to zero time. It could have been just like a big cat meme that just started everything. <laughs> One interesting aspect is that when we study the cosmic microwave background, the light that was released when the universe was very, very hot at that particular moment, and when we study how galaxies are spreading away from us, what we can do is get a picture of how the expansion of the universe changed over time. I, I guess the, the parallel is, like, imagine if I had a ball, and I was standing on the surface of the Earth, and I threw the ball straight up into the air. You can tell based on how the ball accelerates over the course of its journey from, from gravity, you can, you can use that information to figure out how much mass is at the center of the Earth, how much the overall total mass of the Earth. And similarly, if you, if you take enough data for how the universe has been expanding over time, you can figure out kind of what types of matter are in it. You can kind of weigh the universe. And if you do that, interestingly enough, all evidence also points to there being dark matter. And that's interesting because it's a different type of measurement than, than these rotation curves. We don't know where when we're doing this calculation or what exactly this dark matter is, but you can tell from multiple types of measurements that it has to be in the universe. And so we're pretty sure it exists, and we've got a, a good sense of what it needs to do to cause gravity to act the way it does. It's pretty fascinating. Why do we why do we think it's an it? Like why do we think it's a one thing? Maybe we don't. I mean, wh what if it's a million different things that are encompassed into one kind of concept? Yeah, right. The tables are set essentially to spend the rest of the episode talking about what it could be. It's a fascinating thing because as soon as you hear essentially the evidence I put forward to you, you start to wonder what it might be. The basic answer is it we're not sure if it's if it's that we don't understand the rules of gravity. But it looks like more than one piece of evidence points to it being something. 
that there's stuff out there that's causing this gravitation instead of us misunderstanding the laws of gravity. And just to kind of like, uh, maybe I, maybe you glazed over this or I misunderstood it, but you're saying that the majority of the universe is this question mark matter. There is about 10 times in terms of per kilogram, there's about 10 times more dark matter than there is regular matter. And we're convinced it's matter. Well, matter in quotation marks. So let's talk about what the possibilities are. As Ben said, there's something out there that we don't know what it is. So one of the theories that was put forward is that the particles were, we know that they have to have mass because we know that they, you know, they, they exert gravity on other things. But the fact that we don't see them interacting with light means that they don't interact with the electromagnetic force and we don't know that they don't interact with the strong force. So there's only there's only one force left that they could interact with, which is the the weak force. So they got the name weakly interacting massive particles or wimps. You know, there's no end to the jokes that come from searching for uh, dark matter and and looking for wimps all the time. (laughs) In fact, one of the the greatest shirts I had is I, I worked for the the Lux this this experiment that's going on in South Dakota, and they used to have shirts that say that it was just nerds looking for wimps, which uh, I used to like to uh, wear a lot. But anyway, so <laughs> as you said, though, quite correctly, uh, we don't know what's going on and we don't know if it's just one thing. So these kind of this theory of these wimps was put forward. But then some other people started to think, what if it's something else? What if it's just, you know, instead of having kind of lighter mass particles spread out evenly? What if it's kind of clumped into larger mass particles? And and they decided that these were these, these things called compact halo objects. And so the full acronym became Massive Astrophysical Compact Halo Objects, or MACHOs, uh, which, which set up, of course... It, it was very wisely done to set up the wimps versus machos. But, but these machos, they could be a number of things things. Um, at the time, I believe it was, you know, hypothesized these were, you know, different types of stars like brown dwarfs that are going on. So they don't really interact with light, but they still, you know, provide mass, the required mass that we need. But um, it's kind of theories have moved on. And now maybe they're black holes that are somewhere that have stuck around for, for a long time and that kind of thing. So not knowing what it is leaves the door open to look for a number of different things and potentially a combination of a number of different things. Uh, so, yeah, it's this kind of we think maybe it's wimps, maybe it's machos, maybe it's something else entirely. The halo in massive compact halo object refers to the halo of the galaxy, which is an area surrounding the galaxy. And the idea is that these machos would be kind of orbiting the, the center of the galaxy with the rest of us. So in the 90s, the argument was, if, if these machos are the source of dark matter, if it's really just planets or uh, brown dwarfs, really, really cold stars, uh, black holes, this kind of thing, if it really is these, then there should be so much of them that occasionally they should pass between us and distant stars. You should occasionally see them getting between us and distant stars. And what we would see if that happened is the light from distant stars would kind of change. And because there should be 10 times more of these than, you know, regular matter, um, they should be everywhere. And so the argument was they should be so plentiful that if you just kind of surveyed the stars regularly, you should be able to see them blinking because of machos passing between us and the stars. So they did the survey and they found that, uh, only about 10% the number they expected. So this is interesting. It doesn't mean that there are no machos out there. Sure, there's lots of machos, but there aren't nearly enough to account for that 10 times the regular matter mass. So there's something's missing. What kind of light were they using for that survey? I mean, uh, you, you mentioned that there was multiple different ways to view and, and kind of uh, analyze the different spectrums that we, we kind of use this as a study. I think it was regular starlight. Hmm. Caitlin, yeah, it was know? regular starlight. And there's actually a limit to what mass of these machos you can look at, uh, because at some point the magnification uh, gets reduced if the light, if the wavelength of light is uh, very, very small compared to the deflection uh, that you would get from this uh, macho. 
So yeah, you can only look for machos above a certain mass. Otherwise, the deflection is not going to be big enough to see a fluctuation in the starlight. Hmm. So if there's a bunch of tiny little black holes, uh, they're not macho enough to bend the light in a way that we could recognize them if they pass between us. Oh, burn. So <laughs> the deal is that it's not big machos. It, it might still be tiny little machos. We're not sure. But we're pretty sure that, that it's not something as simple as the universe is full of really cold planets. Uh, so what's it going to be? I guess the wimps have the day. The wimps yeah. shall inherit the earth. That's right. You know, you've covered like four weeks of, you know, graduate physics in this so far in the last 25 minutes. Well, donors who donate $2 a month to our podcast um, know that they're getting uh, two weeks worth of uh, graduate <laughs> physics and I like all that it. tuition they're saving. Yeah, so um, there's four forces that we know about as being fundamental in our universe. Uh, of course, we have gravity. That's the force that keeps us on the Earth and allowed us to discover that we think that there is dark matter. We also have electricity and magnetism, uh, which, you know, typically we think of them as being different forces, right? Electricity is what powers lights and magnetism is what keeps magnets stuck to your fridge, but secretly they're really one force. Um, and then we have the strong and weak nuclear forces. Uh, the strong one is what holds quarks together into protons and neutrons. Uh, and the strong force also holds protons and neutrons together into atomic nuclei. Um, so the strong force does a lot of uh, stuff. It gives us, you know, heavy elements like gold. And then there's this weak force, um, which uh, is very, very weak. Uh, it's very rarely the case that the weak force matters in our day-to-day -day life. Um, and so there's a particle that exists in the standard model of particle physics called the neutrino, where, you know, the neutrino only interacts with the weak force. And just to give you a sense of how weak the weak force is, uh, there's around 100 billion neutrinos streaming through your pinky every second, and yet you never feel them. Um, the odds of them interacting with your pinky are very, very low. Uh, in fact, if you wanted to stop neutrinos, you would need uh, more than a light year of lead to stop them because they're so weakly interacting with the lead. So the weak force is very, very, very weak. Um, and it turns out that uh, one reason why WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, came to prominence is because if you have very, very weak interactions um, between regular matter and dark matter, you can actually make dark matter in the early universe. And it turns out that if the dark matter has this uh, weak scale interaction strength, so it's interacting like the way neutrinos interact, uh, and if it has a weak scale mass, you can actually explain why we have as much dark matter in the universe as what we see. This is sometimes called the Wimp miracle. But of course, you know, maybe the dark matter, uh, it doesn't have to interact with the weak force. It could interact even weaker than that. So that would be uh, a feeble interaction. So I don't want to say weak because I don't want to confuse you and make you think that it's the same weak interaction that neutrinos interact with. Uh, it could be something that's even weaker than the weak interaction. So it's a feeble interaction. Okay, let's review what she, she just said, because this is pretty important. So there are four forces. There's electromagnetism and gravity. Those are the ones we're used to interacting with. And then there's two nuclear forces, strong and weak. So the WIMP, the weakly interacting massive particle that we don't know anything about, the, the W in that, the weakly, that refers to the weak force. So we're talking about a particle that we think it doesn't bind to other nucleuses the way uh, a proton or a neutron would. Instead, it just passes right through. And it doesn't interact with light. So if you shone light at it, it wouldn't speed up or slow down or anything light would just pass right through instead we think sometimes when it's close enough to like something in a nucleus that interacts using this weak force sometimes very rarely it can interact with those things and so it barely interacts at all so the the principle here is that it's the dark matter particles we don't know what forces they might be interacting with right we we don't know how they're pushing on each other if they're pushing on each other at all we know that light doesn't work on them we know that they have gravity, but we don't know necessarily that it interacts using the weak or the strong force, okay? That's an assumption. But the basis of that assumption is that if we imagine that there was such a particle that only interacted using the weak force and gravity, 
um, if there were such a particle, then the way it would interact with the rest of the matter in our universe as the universe went through the Big Bang would predict that there, you would get that nice 10 times regular matter um, interaction. So there's some justification for imagining that this dark matter particle is a, a weakly interacting dark, dark matter particle, that it's a wimp, just because, hey, if, if it were, that would explain the, the reason why we'd have the correct quantity of them that we are seeming to be detecting using gravity. Makes sense, more or less, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Caitlin mentioned neutrinos. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. I've heard about neutrinos in the sense that, like, there are beaver-like rats that live in, like, Thailand called neutrinos, you know, and different mammalia in the zoology field, and, and also certainly the cryptozoology field. I didn't know about these neutrinos. No, 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 wait, this is more interesting than anything we've said so far. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> neutrinos? Oh, yeah. They're like the biggest rats. I mean, think about a rat that's as big as a Labrador, you know? I mean, these things are just swimming around Vietnam right now, and... uh you know, they make up about uh, 10 to 85 percent of the universe. Also. <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, they're everywhere. These, these giant rat like neutrinos. And there are I mean, they have different names. And um, neutrinos is what I like to call it because it just sounds kind of cool. But Google them sometime. They, they, uh, they don't look as cool as they sound. But, yeah, neutrinos are basically the beavers of the East. This is incredible. I had no idea that R.O.U.S. has existed and that they were called neutrinos. <laughs> this is the greatest day ever. It's up there. <laughs> so neutrinos are something Caitlin already mentioned that neutrinos interact weakly. So there's a big candidate for, for you know, hey, this may be a wimp, right? So that's that's a mark in its favor. And kind of recently ish, it has been confirmed that neutrinos have mass. So they are they're also massive particles. So they would actually fit under the kind of weakly interacting massive particle banner, if that's the way you want to think of it. Uh, there were at least people that theorized that neutrinos could make up the dark matter. The only problem with this is that even though neutrinos are prevalent, as you heard, like the particle of the neutrino is prevalent, they just aren't massive enough to make up uh, the dark matter as, as we know it. So we, we see lots of them. There's lots of them streaming around, but they just can't make up all of the dark matter uh, that we have identified so far, the number that we're aiming for to, to be able to make up here. Actually, the strongest constraint on their mass comes from cosmology. The fact that we actually exist puts a limit on the neutrino mass, uh, because if neutrinos were all of the dark matter, if their mass matched what it would have to be to be all of the dark matter, uh, then we would you know, not have galaxies because it would just suppress uh, the formation of galaxies because neutrinos get born in the hot Big Bang. They're zipping around really fast and they have a hard time coalescing into galaxies. Neutrinos are really fun particles. Um, they're fun for a bunch of different reasons. One is that they're actually cutting edge physics. But one reason I like them is they're kind of like pennies. <laughs> um, neutrinos are particles that get made every time there's a nuclear decay or any nuclear fusion, or nuclear fission. Anytime anything nuclear happens, a couple neutrinos are made. It's like how every time you go to the store and bring back a pair of shoes, you have a couple more neutrino <laughs> or pennies in your pocket. And the thing is, because they're so weakly interacting, the energy carried off by the neutrino, it has almost no opportunity to turn back into something more useful, like a proton. It's just going to stay a ne neutrino forever. So the universe is full of all these, like penny neutrinos just zipping around, not interacting with anything, because lots of nuclear reactions have happened since the start of the universe, and every time one happens, you get a couple more neutrinos floating around out there. So if we're talking about WIMPs in the, in the dark matter particle sense, uh, this is something that I spent a long time trying to do. Basically, what we, we are looking for is we're trying to exploit the fact that these things exist in the sense that they will interact gravitationally or scatter with uh, other particles around. So WIMP detectors traditionally have been big tanks of stuff. And what you do is you watch that stuff and you wait to see when one of these particles comes into your detector and it, it bounces off of a nucleus in that stuff. So the nucleus bounces back a little bit, kind of like, you know, pool balls, except one is much bigger than the other. 
So the, this this tiny little web comes in like a little ping pong ball, and it hits like a a basketball of a nucleus in your detector. And that nucleus just bounces back a tiny bit. And we're looking for the energy that is deposited when that basketball bounces backwards just that little bit. Uh, so it's not an easy game, which I think is not just me saying that because you know we haven't been successful yet and I'm trying to justify my position. But also, I mean, many, many uh, people have been looking for this for decades at this point, and nobody has found any sign of these things actually existing. Yeah, so there's, there's a bunch of different ways you can try and see this little deposit of energy that, that comes out. But basically, as of yet, we have been unsuccessful to actually have one of these things interact and us detect it in, in our detectors. So are, are we using the wrong detectors or what, what if you had like a, uh, you know, a magic wand, how would we go for, like to the next step? Oh, this is, but that's, that's a very good question. One of the things that might be happening is we could be using the wrong detectors. We could be trying to look for these things in kind of a range that they don't exist in. Basically, we can look in certain areas, you know, we can look at these in terms of certain masses and certain certain likelihoods of interacting. And so that's what we're doing because it's all we can do. But there's a very good chance, as you're saying, that they aren't there, that that's not the properties that these particles have. So we may be just using the wrong detectors for doing this, in which case, I mean, you know, I've wasted a significant part of my career, but still, it would be good to know that. If I had a magic wand, I would want to know what the properties of these things are so that then we could build a detector to properly detect them. I, I want to add something just a little bit before we move on. So Ken's speaking uh, about where the particle could be and where they're looking. Uh, and in those cases, he's speaking kind of metaphorically in, in terms of uh, maybe parameter space. Uh, the idea here is that we have a whole bunch of different theoretical candidates for what these WIMPs might be. So the WIMP detectors are there to detect and interact pretty much any WIMP, no matter what type of these theoretical particles they might be. So they're sensitive to any WIMP that are, has maybe mass in a specific range or has energy in a specific range um, or interacts in a specific way. And so when they build these detectors, if they find them in that range, great. Then you've got actual data about what the actual WIMPs are. But in this case, uh, if they don't detect anything, what it does is it kind of rules out certain theoretical possibilities. So it's not just the case that we're building these things going, I don't know, maybe we'll see something. There's a whole theoretical background and the detection or the non-detection of these instruments, if we, even if we can't tell which of these theories might be right, if you don't detect anything, they can still be used to, to filter out which theories might be wrong. I want to paraphrase something by Edison, because I think in terms of, you know, inventing the light bulb, he came up with a lot of prototypes that ultimately didn't work very well. And someone asked him about it and, you know, asked him, you know, oh, do you feel sad that you, you know, wasted all of this time? And I think he said something to the effect of like, well, I didn't waste time. I, I discovered thousands of ways not to make a light bulb. Um, and I think that's sort of the case with dark matter as well, you know, where as we, as we look for dark matter and if we don't find it, um, that tells us what dark matter is not. And we actually are learning something. We're, we're ruling out possibilities for what it might be by learning what it is not. I was thinking about that the other day about like how many great scientists and great minds out there, their final contribution to the world was like proving that a significant portion of their life was wasted on a certain thing, but then saving other people having the trouble of going down that same route. I mean, it is just as important as anything else, you know? Oh, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, it is important to get out there and look for these things and then, you know, publicize the fact that you haven't found it so that yeah. other people aren't spending the same time so that the collective knowledge can be increased. That's certainly true. And in terms of, you know, going through your career and, and looking back and only finding that you've done nothing. I mean, well, I mean, I won't sleep well tonight, but uh, it, it is the kind of thing that keeps you up. Well, it's like a great metaphor for dark matter because it's like not nothing. It's something, you know, <laughs> but it's not, not it's not, not right. something that we can detect. You know, it's like a thing that's proven wrong. That's true. And, and what, what we can say is that the experiments that are currently operating have pretty conclusively proven that the dark matter is not the masses and likelihoods that we think it is uh, or that we thought it was. 
So we have to look in different areas and we have to find different ways to try to detect these things. Maybe we have to make detectors that can tell where it's coming from and, and we can then use those instead. Or maybe we have to look at an entirely different type of particle and start looking for that. That is amazing that the, the majority of the universe is, is something that we don't even... I mean, it's mind blowing to a layman like me to think that that is like a, a true thing. This is just a thing that an idiot like me would throw out there. But like, what are the chances that this is like something that's interdimensional or something that is so far into a different sport that we can't even look in our field anymore? You know? Yeah, I mean, I would say that there is no guarantee that nature has to be nice to us. The reason we know that dark matter is there is because it interacts with gravity. And that could be it. Uh, that could be all, folks. Uh, we, we just don't have any way to know a priori. Uh, but, you know, what we have to do since we're scientists, uh, right, and the scientific method is all about coming up with ideas that are testable, is we have to say, you know, well, what could dark matter be? Uh, and what, what kind of properties could it have in such a way that we would be able to test it? And then, of course, you know, if we had infinite money, uh, we could build all the experiments and test all of the ideas. But uh, as it stands, you know, we have to just think very carefully about what are the experiments that we're going to dedicate you know, money and time and right. These are, these are human lives. Like people are spending like years of their life building these experiments. So you really have to have a, a strong motivation um, to spend years of your life on something, which, which could turn out to not be how nature works. Uh, that might just be how the cookie crumbles. What do you think would be the most exciting thing to find out about dark matter? Like uh, if you had a million dollars or billion, bazillion, of course, trillion, gazillion, intimate, uh, in infinite dollars you could use to throw into research and instruments here for wimp detection. What would you want to find that would be the most mind blowing thing to a layman? Well, I think, you know, we don't have any guarantee that it interacts with us through any force other than gravity. So if we were to discover that dark matter was interacting with us through some non gravitational force, uh, that would be really interesting. Um, if I got really greedy, I think it would be really interesting if we were to learn that dark matter wasn't just one monolithic thing. You know, if it was actually as complicated as the particles that we know and love, you know, we have electrons, protons, neutrons, neutrinos. We have all these particles we've been talking about. Um, and, you know, there's there's a, a wide variety and it's highly conceivable that the dark matter could also have a variety uh, and who knows, maybe it has its own forces associated to it. Um, you know, like we have our four forces, maybe dark matter has its own uh, forces. So I think that would be, if I, you know, could answer any question, I would want to know, does it come with its own, uh, you know, array of particles and forces? Like a whole dark physics. Yeah, that's that's really what I'm interested in, in in figuring out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if it had infinite yeah. money and time. I would just add that, from a kind of a sociological perspective, I think the one thing that experimentists like me will often say is that our greatest fear is actually finding something. Oh, wow. It's very easy to keep continuing on and, and doing what we're doing. But if we find something, the work really starts. And then, I mean, it's going to be, you have to prove it and the skepticism that would come with it, it would be terrifying to actually find something. <laughs> Like the dog catching the car. Yeah. Yeah, we found it. Now what are we going to do with it? Yeah. What's that theory that like the worst thing we'd want is to find alien life? The discovery of life on another planet or something is both the most exciting and detrimental and terrifyingly awful thing for us to, to discover, maybe. And who knows if like if dark matter plays into that, you know, to some degree. I, I always think about dark matter. If it's, if it's this large portion of the universe that we don't know about. <laughs> the way that things are right now, we can't handle our own shit like in America, you know, with like the elections and stuff, the anxiety that we get, like to, to add on top of like, well, we figured out dark matter and there's four more principles of physics, by the way. And then here's aliens. You know, I mean, it's <laughs> we just like we would collectively have our head explode and like that wouldn't be good for anybody either. And there'd be 10 times more uh, aliens than there are us. But, you know, those aliens would never be able to communicate with us uh, by sending, like, radio waves or something. They would have to do it through some other means. Oh, which would make dis diplomacy even ten times harder, probably. Yeah, probably. that's right. But they couldn't watch our TV, so that, at least, <laughs> those secrets are safe. Melrose Place isn't going to contaminate them. <laughs> well, they're going to miss out on the golden age of television. <laughs> yeah. It's a real shame for them. I like how your mind went to Melrose Place, like right off the bat, you know, like, <laughs> damn it, Melrose Place is off the table. So the fascinating thing about WIMPs is that 
We are assuming that the particles are weakly interacting, and there's no guarantee that they are. If they are, then it's good because, hey, this, uh, this WIMP miracle, it solves another mystery, which is how come there's so much of it? But there's no guarantee, like Caitlin said, that they interact using the weak force at all. As we continue on in our search for WIMPs, people like me who think about theory uh, don't have much more to do because people... Like experimenters are looking for wimps, and so we need we need something else to occupy ourselves. Um, so a lot of people have started thinking a lot about axions, which are our dark matter candidates that talk to the strong nuclear force. And these particles are actually quite handy uh, in solving an, another mystery. In addition to solving the mystery of dark matter, they could address why certain interactions that could happen with the strong nuclear force seem to not happen. Um, usually in physics, if something doesn't happen, that's because there's some fundamental reason why. Unless you know that reason, it seems like whatever can happen should happen. But that seems to not be the case with certain interactions in uh, the strong force. So axions actually address that, and they also address dark matter. And so that's another candidate people are thinking about um, and proposing new ways to look for it. That's a, a very active area right now, people thinking of new experimental techniques to look for this other kind of dark matter that would interact with the strong force. So yeah, some of the ways people think about that uh, is that if you interact with the strong force, then necessarily uh, due to quantum effects, you're also going to interact with magnetic fields. Uh, it's just a, a funny thing about nature. And if you interact with magnetic fields, then you can actually potentially see these dark matter candidates by, by looking in regions where you know either they naturally have a very strong magnetic field, like looking at certain kinds of uh, exotic astrophysical objects that have really, really high magnetic fields, or you could try to make a really, really strong magnetic field in the lab and try to see if one of these ambient dark matter axion particles comes through. And if that were to happen, what would happen inside of a magnetic field is it would convert into a, light, a particle of light uh, and you would be able to d detect it. So that's a really active area right now, yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Really that sounds like the best idea to me. Like, let's make one of these super massive magnetic fields and pull one of these things through. I mean, <laughs> I can't imagine there being any sort of like uh, backlash to that. That sounds awesome as crap, actually. Yeah, it's um, it's a really exciting area. So yeah, people thinking of all these different ways that you can manipulate different configurations of magnetic fields. So one example to look for these axions is these so-called light shining through the wall experiments. What happens is you have some wall that's opaque to light, it's impermeable to light, uh, and you make a really, really strong magnetic field. So what could happen is if you have light that converts into axions in this magnetic field, then those axions could then pass through that wall. The, the wall wouldn't be impervious to the axions because the wall and the axion aren't interacting very much. Um, and then on the other side of the wall, if, you, if the axion sees a strong magnetic field, it could convert back into light and you would then see the light shining through that wall. So that's one cool example uh, of, of just a clever manipulation of these magnetic fields. Another example is we expect that the sun would actually be potentially a really strong source of axions. Um, and basically, if you point like a telescope at the sun, uh, but you put a really strong magnetic field in that telescope, uh, so you have this, basically this tube with this very strong magnetic field inside, then if the sun is making axions, then the axion could convert into an X-ray inside of that tube. So instead of looking at the sun in visible light, you would be trying to look at the sun in X-rays to look for axions. Wow. Um, just for uh, an idiot layman fiction editor like myself, Norm Sherman, what is an axion? Okay, so an axion is going to be a fundamental particle called an axion. So in WIMPs, the particle didn't interact at all with light, but mostly it interacted through the weak nuclear force. Axions interact with the strong nuclear force. So light waves are going to pass right through them. They do something special in a big magnetic field, but for the most part, they're just passing through everything the way WIMPs do, except that they could interact with the strong nuclear force instead of the weak one, which means that uh, it's, it's kind of bad that earlier nuclear physicists called these two forces the strong and the weak force. I mean, I know that one is stronger than the other, and the other is weaker than the other, so good on them for that. But it really makes these descriptions difficult. So there's this strong nuclear force, and uh, axions can feel a push or a pull from you know the nuclei of particles through this force. And so mostly that's how they're interacting with the rest of the universe, except if they hit a, a magnetic field. I guess sometimes the devil's in the details. They might turn into a speck of light. So... The, the principle here is essentially the same as the principle behind how 
WIMP's work, except that it's a strong nuclear interaction instead of a weak one, which means that we can detect them in slightly different ways. I want to clarify, and but I mean, axions aren't really interacting very much with atomic nuclei. Basically, the strong nuclear force is uh, very short range. So everything is really, really close together. Uh, and axions coming in, they actually don't really interact very much with that strong nuclear force uh, that's happening inside of uh, these nucleons. The primary way people are looking for these axions is with this magnetic field effect that I mentioned. But they're essentially hypothetical, right? Yeah, these are yes. hypothetical. I mean, if they exist, it's, we're talking about low mass kind of things that are floating around, but ultimately we don't really know if axions are a thing or not. That's right. Yeah. Okay. The deal is we know dark matter exists. We're pretty sure it's a particle. And then we gave it to the theory community and they know everything about all the different forces and all the different possibilities. And they said, and we said to them, Hey, can you imagine what this thing might be based on the parameters? We know it has mass. We know it has to interact gravitationally. And then they came up with lots and lots and lots and lots, lots of different answers. Hmm. So, so for example, we know of one WIMP particle. It's the uh, neutrino. We know neutrinos exist, um, but we also know that dark matter particles aren't neutrinos. So what could they be? The, the jury is still out. Until Ken comes back with a result, we don't know. Um, but the, the neat thing here is that the type of detector that you build is going to be different depending on whether it's a WIMP in those cases, you want a great big thing that's just going to jiggle slightly once every hundred trillion times something bumps into it, or whether you're dealing with a strong nuclear force particle like these axions. So if these axions, because they are going to interact with the universe in a slightly different way than, say, the WIMPs would, because the details of how they feebly interact with the, with the universe are slightly different than the WIMPs, you're gonna, you can use different uh, effects to try to detect them. So the idea is that um, if one of these uh, axions hits a, a really strong magnetic field, there's a small chance that it will turn into a speck of light. And if a speck of light, a photon, hits a strong magnetic field, if axions exist, we don't know if they exist, but if they did exist, we know that there's a slight chance that our speck of light in hitting a strong magnetic field might turn into an axion. So the light through the wall experiment is essentially saying it's like... Uh, it's like light comes in, and it's going to hit the wall. Mm -hmm. but before it hits the wall, some of the light's going to hit the magnetic field, and some of that light's going to turn into axions. And if it's an axion, it's just going to pass through everything, and it'll pass through the wall just fine. But when it hits the other side of the wall where there's another magnetic field, it might change back into light. So even though all the light should be absorbed by the wall, some of the light is turning into an axion, then turning back into light and passing through it. Okay, okay. So that's how that detector works. And that would be, like, I guess, in like, if, like a, a science fiction editor's perspective, a pretty disappointing outcome because it would just be like things are the way they are, but there's axioms floating around. They exist. They have low mass, you know, and, they, and things are basically how we know them to be, but they're axioms. Yeah, except that the way, the way we talk about axioms existing are very 1960s science fiction. So I think science fiction writers would be pretty happy with your, <laughs> with your weird particle that can turn into and out of light. They have laser, right? laser beams that go pew, pew, and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. Turn, yeah, and make axion like, beams. That axion turn, beams, yeah. yeah. So I, I think the science fiction writers are probably more worried about uh, the dark matter particle being a wimp than an axion. I could probably, yeah, I'd agree with that. Because at least axions do really cool things. <laughs> yeah. Given that there's so much uncertainty on what this hypothetical dark matter particle is or is not, there's very little certainty that any experiment that we build would necessarily detect a dark matter particle or, or find out what dark matter is. So a lot of people recently have been thinking about, well, is there a way that we could uh, explore and look for dark matter in a way that's free? And one way that you could do that is to say, well, we've had a lot of stuff out there that, you know, in the past could have interacted with dark matter, but didn't. Um, and can we say something about what dark matter is or is not uh, based on not seeing certain things? Um, so one example is just kind of a, a crazy one is that, you know, the, the whole history of humanity, uh, we don't have any recorded history of people just spontaneously dying due to mysterious gunshot-like injuries. And actually that tells you that dark matter can't be too heavy and uh, interact too strongly with humans. And that actually gives you a unique statement that you can make about the 
mass and the inter- interaction strength of dark matter. Hmm. Yeah, there are there are several documented cases of like spontaneous combustion and weird ass shit like that uh, that go beyond our historical record even. Are you proposing that maybe maybe there would be a historical record of like <laughs> so I, think uh, is, I think this is interesting now. Maybe spontaneous <laughs> human combustion is caused by dark matter interactions. Yeah. <laughs> it could be, yeah. So the dark matter particle might be uh, a really little particle with really low mass, and there might be lots and lots and lots of them, or it might be fewer really heavy things. But if they're heavy, then they've got to be moving real fast. And if we interacted one with one of them, they would deposit all of that energy into us. And so you can say, based on this, that they can't be heavier than a certain thing because, you know, on occasion, it's not just particle detectors that would interact with a wimp. Anything with mass could absorb or interact with a wimp. It's just that the recoil off it is so small, you need a really sensitive detector to detect it. So here's the neat thing. You could say, okay, well, if that's true, you know, what if interacting with a wimp was actually a very energetic, very destructive... And also really high cross-section. Yeah, yeah, a really strong interaction. Like it would be if if these wimps had really, really high mass... Um, if that were the case, then then occasionally people would just explode for no reason in the one in a 10 billion chance that one of these particles passing through you actually interacted with you. And because we know that people don't generally explode into flames, we think we know that. We can say that there's an upper bound for how much each of these wimps should weigh. I mean, I guess the thing that I do actually really like about that idea is that we go from having these detectors that we have to you know put two kilometers underground and shield and all this stuff to the dark matter raining death down upon us which is kind of a neat switch (laughs) wait why would that's that's a thing i didn't know about and i was going to ask about dark matter at some point raining death upon us but was kind of just tiptoeing around it uh (laughs) why would that happen and how could that happen i mean why, why are we putting these things underground and why is dark matter a threat to us well, no. So we put these things underground, but I mean, this is this this uh, idea that is being hypothesized is oh, that if dark it. matter had these parameters that could actually interact with you know people, then it would be this kind of switch from having very delicate machines to you know death every once in a while from combustion caused by dark matter. It's, an, it's a very pleasing um, you know melding of two different ideas. Uh, pleasing is probably not what I want to put there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I do like how you come up with the arbitrary two meters underground, because at least now we know to the extent of undergroundness that these things need to go in order to study them. So, Oh, they need to go deep underground. It's okay. So the dark matter detector that I work, or one of them, two of them that I work on, we actually put them two kilometers underground. Oh, kilometers, so six, not 6,800 feet. feet. Yeah. Okay. So we do that to basically shield out all of the radiation that's around us all the time. It's coming in from space and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we put two kilometers of rock overhead, and that that means that it's quiet enough, quiet in quotes, uh, that we can actually potentially see these dark matter interactions. Mm-hmm. Then if it had turned out that it was this, you know, gunshot theory, then I would be mm-hmm. safe when I'm two kilometers down there. Dark matter neutrino detection is so cool because they have to go through such extraordinary lengths to get material that is so sensitive and also collect so much of it to detect such a small signal that they also have to shield it. So, they, like, uh, for instance, you have to, there's one called Ice Cube, Ken used to work on it, in Antarctica, which is a cubic kilometer of really, really, really old glacier ice deep under a glacier. Essentially, they, they use these uh, hot water to tunnel their way, tunnel these detectors down into the bottom of this huge, enormous glacier in Antarctica. And the, the, the ice is so clear down there, and it's under so much other ice that only things like neutrinos and things that interact very feebly with the rest of the universe can pass through. And, and you had kids... It's kind of even more than just that. At Ice Cube, we're looking for neutrinos that have passed through the entire Earth and are coming up into our detector from the Earth. Uh, we just need to shield it from all the stuff that's coming down. <laughs> wow. And that's how every H.P. Lovecraft story starts, too. You got, <laughs> as drilled down there. And yeah, you end it all. Easy. I mean, that's... Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Norm, have you got any other questions that you want us to talk about? Anything that didn't make sense? 
Well, I, you know, I've always kind of wondered the difference. Or, or we've been talking about dark matter, but there's dark energy too. And does this sprawl yes. us into a whole other conversation? It, it, it is a good question. So at the very start, we were talking about, it's called cosmology. We were looking at the expansion of the universe and the history of expansion of the universe. Okay. And I kind of related it to an, a, a ball that you throw up into the air to, to figure out how much mass the earth has. Uh, essentially, as the, as the universe expands, gravity is kind of slowing down the expansion. So you would expect you'd expect the expansion of the universe to slow down over time. Okay. And so one of the things they are looking for, and they can determine using essentially trying to trying to get a profile for the expansion history of the universe is how much matter there is, what's it made of, and how can you use that information to describe and explain how the universe has expanded over, over its history. The premise being that it's slowing down. Um, so when they finally had this data, they looked at distant, distant galaxies to see how they were moving away from us to, to get this profile. Um, when they finally did that, they found that the universe used to be expanding slower than it is currently today. That the rate that it's expanding is speeding up, which is weird. Nobody knows why. Um, just like with dark matter, uh, one candidate for it is that our, our laws of physics are wrong. Um, it, it might be that, that the, we, we don't properly understand gravity and that, uh, a slightly different theory of gravity than Einstein's theory might be required to explain why the universe is expanding the way it is. Um, Another theory, though, is that there's a type of matter that's getting more potent gravitationally as the universe goes on. And this, this, this matter is called dark energy, and it's got this really weird property. Um, usually, when you spread things out, they get weaker and more diffuse, right? Right. Like, if you... Uh, if you if you have a, a cubic meter of peanut butter and then you spread it out over ten cubic meters, you have less peanut butter in every cubic meter. Somehow, for our universe to expand the way it does, we need a type of material that kind of gets more gravitationally potent the more it spreads out, or 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 not at all, kind of. So the biggest simplest candidate is something called the cosmological constant, which just you can't spread it out. Uh, there's there's a fixed amount of it in every cubic meter in the universe. And as the universe expands and adds more cubic meters to its size, each of those has some of this this constant in it. There's other possibilities. Uh, one of them is called uh, phantom energy, which is uh, an accelerating energy where, you know, the more you spread it out, the denser it gets somehow. Nobody's quite sure what it is. So uh, we need more data, and we're in the process of getting more and more accurate data to get a better sense of what this dark energy is. But um, one way to think about this is dark matter is probably some kind of particle. We don't know what. We know that it's not regular matter, that it behaves in a slightly different way than regular matter. Um, but we, we think it's a regular particle. Uh, this dark energy argument is motivated by a similar thing. It's motivated by cosmological data, data about what the universe is doing at the very, 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 very large scale. Um, but our sense of what it is is still, we've got no idea. Mm. So just like dark matter, there's a whole bunch of different candidates, in fact, for what it might be. A whole bunch of theorists, some of them say, oh, we, we think we need to modify Einstein's laws of gravity in such and such a way. Other people have other proposals for particles that might be doing it. Nobody's quite sure yet. I would say that the only thing that dark matter and dark energy necessarily have in common is that they both have dark in the title, which you could argue is a is a PR uh, nightmare. Yeah, it's a branding thing. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some brand confusion going on, but they need not have anything to do with each other. Yeah, that's an important point to take away. I think people like definitely associate the two uh, very like they intertwine them. Uh, intimately, I think, because of that word, but that branding is wrong, is what you're saying. We're not, not, not wrong per se, but skewed. I think what we learned from this uh, podcast episode is that physicists should not be left in charge of naming things, right? We had, we had wimps <laughs> and machos. We had uh, the strong and the weak force, which are really hard to talk about when you think about <laughs> hypothetical forces, which could be stronger or weaker. So then what do you call those? <laughs> um, yeah. We have dark matter and dark energy, which are different. It's confusing. 
Um, what I'm really, what I'm really hearing is that we need to, you know, hire some influencers or someone who's going to help our brand awareness. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do love the point that like the first thing physicists go to whenever they're trying to name things is like wimps and machos, you know, like, oh, the, the machos are wrong. It's the wimps that are the ones that we can detect. And then they're strong and weak. And you know? it just it plays into like some sort of carnal, you know, getting bullied in high school because we were all studying like certain types of math and things like that, while other people were, you know, quarterbacks on football teams and getting all the girls. <laughs> it's, it's, it really does come down to wimps and machos in the end of the day, you know. All right. Well, that was a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Caitlin. You've pleased me. Your efforts have borne fruit, and that fruit is sweet. Here is some fruit. Dr. Ken Clark, you get a dragon fruit. Oh, mm, mm, delicious. <laughs> Dr. Caitlin Schutz, here is a pear. Om nom 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 nom. <laughs> I'd like to thank my guest, Norm Sherman, from the Drabblecast. Thank you, Norm. Thank you for having me. You guys are so awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, that was wonderful. Okay, now it's announcement time. First announcement is we are going to have a live show in February at the AAAS 2020 General Meeting in um, Seattle in February. And it's going to be really cool. And I've got some good physicists lined up. And I've got some good guests. And we're going to have lots of fun. So our show is on Sunday if you want to attend. Second, we are finally living in an era where podcasts are mainstream. There are fantastic shows out there for you to listen to, but as people try to listen to podcasts, there's no telling what kinds of shows they will get into. There is a show for every single taste and desire and interest, including physics and astronomy, and that's where you come in. Tell the people you know who might be interested in physics and astronomy about us, and then they can listen to us, and we'll all have fun together. So, we're on Stitcher, Google Play Music, Spotify, Pandora, YouTube, and uh, the iTunes podcast list. Any way you want to listen to us. So, please, rate and review us wherever you can, and also have a fun time telling people about us. Next thing, a uh, quick reminder that... If I can't find a cool guest, or if our planned guest cancels at the last minute, which happens on occasion, I will literally choose a listener from the show to come sit in the guest chair with us and talk to us about physics. Occasionally, when this happens, I will put the call out on Facebook or Twitter and ask people to reply if they want to be a guest and then choose from the people who reply. So to be a guest, you need three things, well, four, including luck, but the first is to follow us on Twitter or Facebook. The second thing is that you need a place with fast, fast, strong, reliable internet and quiet because we need good quality sound. And for that, you need a fast internet connection and also a quiet background. The third thing you need is to be available when we want to record. But those th three things, well, four, I guess, counting luck, uh, that's it. So follow us on Facebook, social media and you might get lucky. Lastly, again, we are humbly soliciting your donations. Your donations go to paying for the server fees, for our episode transcription project, for buying our physicists microphones, and for sending us to Seattle for the 2020 show. You can send one-time donations through PayPal off of our website. Or you can go to our sweet Patreon site and give a recurring $2 or $5 donation. If you give more than $2 and supply your address, I will send you a postcard. Eventually, this particular episode of the Titanium Physicist Podcast has been sponsored by a collection of generous people. First, I would like to thank Cassandra McCarthy, Christoph Beattie, Mr. M.M., the Wild Drew Hickox, the Masker Oscar Delgado, Callan Richardson and Joe Campbell, Asharan Banagiri, J.P. Rauchio, Aaron Wheeler, Sandor Boros, a Badger, the Septet Baylor Fane, a Mr. Luke Edwards, Mr. Astro Yuki, Shivang Patel, Mr. Martin Mihulka, Henry Rabung, Peter Scott, Russ Mutsi, Ayur Singh, and Matthew Sullivan, a Daniel Lauzon, Patrick Eon, Kevin Forsyth, Yer Panay, Hoi Nam Duong, Stian Henriksen, a TPR Jones, Pascal, a man named Ryan R., Michael Usher, Senor Canada, 
Adrian Schoening, Sarah Stradler, Louise Pantanella, a guy named Ben, a Mr. Matthew Lambert, a fellow man named Ayush Singh, David Myrtle, Mr. Ryan Foster, a Janico Freffenberg, Steve Smethurst, Magnus Christensen, Bart Gladys, and Mr. Stuart Pollock, our Emperor Courtney Brooke Davis, Mr. David Lindells, a Carl Lockhart, our eternal friend B.S., Randy Dalzel, Ms. Tina Raudio, the Enigmatic Ryan, a gentleman named Crux, and Gabe, and Evan Weens, David D., Dan Vale, a Mr. Alex, WTL, Mr. Per Proden, Andrew Waddington, Mr. Jordan Young, John Bleasy, a Brittany Crooks, James Crawford, Mr. Mark Simon, Tucson's Gang of One, Mr. Lawrence Lee, Sixton Lennison, Mr. Simon, Keegan Ede, Andreas from Knoxville, Cadby, Joe Campbell, Alexandra Zani is great, Winna Brett, Eric Dutch, Etienne, and a gentleman named Peter Fan, Gareth Eason, Joe Piston, David Johnson, Mr. Anthony Leon, as well as Doug B., Julia, Noah Robertson, Ian and Stu, a Mr. Frank, Philip from Austria, and Noisy Mime, Mr. Shlomo Dalal, Melissa Burke, Yasin Urazazi, Spider Rogue, Insanity Orbits, Robin Johnson, Madame Sandra Johnson, a Mr. Jacob Wick, a Mr. John Keyes, a Mr. Victor C., Ryan Kloss, Peter Clipsham, Mr. Robert Chire, Mr. Jacob S., a gentleman named Brett Evans, a lady named Jill, a gentleman named Greg, thanks Steve, Mr. James Clausen, Mr. Devin North, a gentleman named Scott, Ed Lowlington, Kelly Wienersmith, Jocelyn Reed, a Mr. S. Hatcher, Mr. Rob Abrazado, and Mr. Robert Stietka. So that's it for Titanium Physicists this time. Remember that if you like listening to scientists talk about science in their own words, there are lots of other lovely shows on our Braculo Media Network. The intro song to our show is Tell Bulgari Bulgari's Dead by Ted Leo and the Pharmacists, and the end song is Russia by Ramona Falls. Good day, my friends, and until next time, remember to keep science in your hearts. I visited Russia I started folding Until in one precious Doll I had poured in All of Siberia And I said love here ya Go She said Too little too late Trip to the Nile Where I started swimming On the streams till I found out Where you found the spring growing With God's purest water